their colleagues and, and friends. It's our uh, pleasure to host today Professor Bern Noack. Thanks for, for coming and visiting us. It's a, a, a real pleasure to have you here today. Uh, professor Noack is a National Talent Professor and Chair of Artificial Intelligence and Aerodynamics at Harbin Institute of Technology in Shenzhen, Shen Shenzhen, in China. Shenzhen. <laughs> Not Shenzhen, Shen Shenzhen. Sorry for the pronunciation. I'm Professor and Chair at, uh, of Turbulence and Control at TU Berlin um, in, in Shenzhen, in China. He uh, leads a growing team with three laboratories uh, for the dynamic problems for the low altitude economy, which I guess has to do with drones, air taxis, and this type of thing. So quite hot topic today. And uh, for over three decades, he has worked uh, on engineering turbulence control for transport vehicles in many institutions in Europe and US and China, including the Max Planck um, Institute, the DLR Center, United Technologies Research Center, and so on and so forth. Uh, to Berlin, uh, French National Center for Scientific Research, etc. So a lot of institutions in his career. Uh, he has uh, written a lot of articles. We have a few of them in the in the web uh, uh, linked to this talk. Uh, and he has been awarded with also many national and international awards, highlighting uh, the fact that he's fellow of the American Physical Society. And he got the Fon Mises Award in 2005. And he has been uh, spot as one of the top researchers in mechanical and space engineering by uh, Mendeley. So uh, floor is yours, Professor. Thanks for being here. Okay. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And I thank Andrea and Stefano for inviting me here to this uh, university. I have already been in Madrid before and it's seen the airport and the railroad station, but now I'm in a real university and I've also seen that you have a very beautiful city with beautiful parks and buildings, impressive cathedrals, palaces and so on. So thank you very much for your uh, kind invitation and giving me this floor to talk before uh, so many people. Let's start with something uh, easy. Who of you uh, has heard about China? Raise your hand. <laughs> Almost all, thankfully not. Um, who of you has been in uh, China? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Uh, who of you has been in Shenzhen? <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more. <laughs> Maybe I should also raise my hand. And uh, who of you has been at the HIT in Shenzhen, Harbin Institute of Technology in Shenzhen? Good. A uh, uh, counter question Who of you has been in the United States? So there's an obvious disparity for some reason. <laughs> Professor, I think you can use this slide if you want. Okay, good. And I'll try to be closer. Yes. Okay, works. So you look for uh, um, Spain. It's this block here. And this is China. So China is uh, much bigger than Madrid. This is, has about 1.4 uh, billion people. You see a closer look uh, here has uh, lots of cities. So my city uh, is Shenzhen, and now I need to look for it. Hong Kong, Shenzhen, so it's here. There's an interesting part about China. 96% of the people live uh, east of the Hu line. I think the Hu line is somewhere here. And that means it has 1.4 billion people, but in principle, we can also populate this part here, and we can, that means it can accommodate with, with the density of the east side, uh, 35 billion people. That means there's enough space for talent, talents, like, uh, talents like you. So this is my invitation for you to come to uh, Shenzhen. 
And Shenzhen is an amazingly beautiful city, uh, a bit like uh, Madrid. And uh, 40, over 40 years ago, there was no fi a city. There was just a fisherman's town with 35,000 people. And then uh, <coughs> Deng Xiaoping decided we make this a Silicon Valley. And now, 40 years later, it's a city with about 20 million inhabitants. Not only that, it's a dynamically extremely vibrant city. So I can look on a small river and uh, on the, uh, the small uh, river, there are companies whose revenues is already much larger than the revenues of Silicon Valley. And it's also amazingly uh, beautiful. It has also lots of uh, park. It has a beach. And it is also uh, very safe. Just to give you an idea, here you see my backpack. And when I go in Shenzhen in a cafe, I go, uh, I, I leave it there, put off, out my laptop, and of course, my wallet and every passport, everything here. And then I may go for a walk one hour and then come back. And I trust that everything will be there. So recently, I two weeks ago, I did the same experiment in TU Berlin. So I put it in the office. <laughs> I thought the office was closed. I had a two hour lunch with the institute director and a couple of other people I came back. And I thought the door is closed, but it was open. And uh, uh, my 1,000 euro envelope was also gone. So <laughs> Shenzhen is uh, a really beautiful, nice. Uh, city. So now we <coughs> here you find a see a firework just to prove that they are uh, that they have a, a beach. And now we go a bit to the um, to the to the topic. And let me first explain the title. That's the word control. Turbulence control makes it already pretty hard. And then with many actuators. Now it becomes kind of terrifying. You would also want to have feedback, many sensors. But there is one word which makes all the difference. If you want to see the challenge, um, take for instance this Mercedes avatar. It has a couple of bionic flaps. Uh, these are completely movable. Assume the Mercedes says that they can use the bionic uh, flaps to make it more efficient without actually proving that. Let's assume it's true. Let's, uh, let's also assume you can uh, blow in, in, in the streamwise direction, and now you do some separation control here. And you have to find a control logic uh, for the orientation of these flaps and when to blow in dependency of lots of sensors surrounding it. So this gives you an idea about the complexity. This is something which hardly anybody can do. <coughs> and this can be done with machine learning. And of course, I have to talk, um, acknowledge my funding, National Science Foundation, the Guangdong province, the Shenzhen government, and industry. Just to show you uh, what difference uh, machine learning makes. Uh, when I started my career about 35 years ago, I was hoping that I could uh, uh, give a talk something uh, about that, so using first principles, reduced order models. And with that, the pictures would go from Rodong the Sinker to uh, a Munk, the, the Scream, without any applications on the way. In fact, I tried very hard, 35 years. I had one share of excellence to Corom, abbreviation for turbulence control with reduced order models, and it became turbulence control without reduced order models. But machine learning. Uh, re replacing it. So this is uh, machine learning makes complex turbulence control student proof. And that's why I'm giving this uh, lecture here. And first, I will give you some applications. Uh, then I will give you one simple uh, example for direct reduction of a car, a complex example featuring the complexity of the Mercedes avatar. I will comment what else you can do with machine learning um, in um, fluid mechanics and summarize with an, uh, with, a, with an outlook. At the end, I hope to convince you that machine learning makes things super easy. And of course, I would not be able to 
tell anything <laughs> if somebody would not do the work. And the people who supported this um, talk in, at HIT are mentioned here. My postdoc, Ikonia Makeda, PhD students, Jiang Zhu Tao, uh, Professor Francois Lusserang as co-supervisor of E, and Nan Gao as former member of our team. And I will also mention some legacy work abroad uh, by my former PhD students, Yuko Baro, Ruying Li, or Peter Kaiser, and Daniel Fene. Uh, this has been done in collaboration with many people, as you see from our long uh, list of authors in the papers. For instance, Stephen Panton, Woody Bert King, Tamir Shekharan, Vilja Tatmar, Sam Tyler, and many others. And this brings us to the first example. We, we know as we are moving with a car, we, need, we are consuming energy, we are consuming maybe fuel, and most of the fuel at highway speeds is invested in overcoming the aerodynamic drag. So we want to reduce the aerodynamic uh, drag. The one way of doing that is uh, the aerodynamic design. Here you see the Renault Altica, uh, beautifully aerodynamically designed already. You see it with a diffuser here, the retreating roof here. You see that this wake region has been reduced by the retreating uh, um, sides, and also these gaps are small. These are examples uh, of good aerodynamic design. You can still make the drag uh, better, with some passive control. For instance, you can put some veins at the uh, trailing um, edge. For every passive control, you can uh, find an active control, which has a similar effect. The advantage of the active uh, control is that you can turn it on or off, that you can make it stronger or less strong, that you can play with frequencies, and that you can uh, play with the flow structures that you can do closed loop depending on the flow state. And this is where we have the largest opportunities for drag reduction. Uh, uh, now, 20 years ago, you can look in a magazine called Research and Development, a French magazine, and you will find uh, that the active flow control has already been done by Renault. Here you see the, um, some simulations for zero net mass flux flowing at the trailing edge. Uh, you see a change of the flow. Most importantly, this change leads to 20% drag reduction at 90 kilometers per hour. It's said to reduce the fuel by one liters and requires only 10 watts of the actuation energy. Good. We have already a big success story. Uh, the problem here is that it will cost something like 3,000 euros at that time. And uh, they made a customer, customer inquiry. The customer said, we are not willing to pay that for this type of uh, drag reduction. So this is one of the reasons uh, why we don't see it at CAS yet. There is something much more sexy than normal CAS. So uh, who of you has seen the movie Back in the Future? A lot more than there were people who visited Shenzhen. <laughs> and you will see that a lot of uh, uh, um, modern cars replace the wheels uh, uh, by rotors. And if you have rotors, and the advantage is you can fly. We have seen it in lots of sci-fi uh, movie, movies, and some of them pit, uh, uh, depicted here. But now it becomes more and more reality. We have over 1,000 editor designs uh, in the world. And Shenzhen is pioneering these developments. We are now building 100 vertipods for air taxis. Uh, very soon you can take an air taxi from one place to the other, for instance, with the Yihang uh, or with the um, Xiaopong. And we uh, are building 1,000 vertipods for drone delivery. Okay. I can go to certain areas of the city and order my uh, orange juice with a smartphone and then after some time, a drone will come and give me the uh, um, um, oranges. We will live already part of, of the future. And this may sound like uh, a, a gimmick, 
Uh, but let's look at just one curve. So this is uh, a Morgan Stanley report, and they estimated the total addressable markets, so this is the revenues you can make, with, just with air taxis. Uh, you see the timeline going until uh, 2050, and you see a, a scale going up to 10 trillion US dollars. And so by 2050, the expectation is that the market of uh, air taxis will be around 10 trillion US dollars. And this is more than you have in your pocket. This is more than you and your family will ever own. Uh, uh, this is uh, about 50 times the global train sales in 2021. This is about 84 times the civil aircraft sales uh, re re recently. So these air taxis will become much more important than Boeing, uh, uh, Airbus, and the civil uh, airplanes uh, combined. And it will be even larger than the car sales, roughly by a factor of four. So there are huge opportunities uh, coming with, with the air taxis. And um, these uh, uh, air taxis will change the way we are living. There will not be a rural area anymore in the not too distant future. You can reach any spot uh, on, on, on this planet uh, with an air taxi. As a comparison, if you have drones, drones are said to have something, civil drones. Civil drones are said to have a market around 10 or 20% of these air taxis on, on, on top. So in the future, aerodynamics will be largely applied to air taxis and drones. But they're also very uh, conventional applications uh, shown here. For instance, we have talked already about the car. You can apply it to, to trains, to ships, to uh, the engines of the aircraft, uh, to the lift of them. Uh, wind turbines require some form of turbulence control in chemical engineering. It can dramatically change the performance. And before you apply the actuators and sensors and some control logic for some performance benefits in a real application, you typically try it in some geometrically simple flows. And what I want to convince you today that one of the problems is solved, namely the control logic with the tools of machine learning. So in the control logic, we need to translate the, what we know, the sensor signals into an actuation command. And if you want to have this feedback control, we can may follow the classical paradigm like I did over 20 years ago. And this means first you understand, then your model, then you use your model for the control design, then test and tune the control in the plant. It's a bit like fighting the controller. It takes a long uh, uh, time in each of the steps at the end. You, have, you need lots of human modeling for simple controllers addressing one or two frequencies. So machine learning allows you first to do the optimization and the plant, then you get the controller for the winning mechanisms, then you can do the modeling, and then now you open your textbooks for the Navier-Stokes equations and can try to understand what the wishful uh, uh, fairy uh, did for you. So now you can do fully automated complex controllers with one hour winter testing time. You can come with a software package to the experiment and then you have a good solution at a very short period of time. So any questions so far? Good. Now we go to two examples. One example is uh, related to the car, of course. I will show you the successes of machine learning control, and the next one is related to the uh, smart scale, uh, to, to, to multimodal distributed actuation. The first story has been created uh, less than 10 years ago in beautiful Poitiers, which is here. Who of you has been in Poitiers? Okay, also more than in Shenzhen. <laughs> So here in Poitiers, we have built uh, an Ahmed body. The Ahmed body has four um, 
jet actuators at the four sites, independently operable. And we monitor the floor with 12 pressure sensors. This Ahmed body is put on a drag balance. When the flow comes from left to right, we can measure the force on the Ahmed body. And our goal is to use the actuation in order to reduce uh, the uh, drag. When we look at the LES simulations for the same configurations, we see already lots of frequencies. There are some high frequencies in the shear layers. There are some common frequencies in the wave, and there are also low frequencies from the meandering uh, by stability uh, of the wave. So now the, uh, we get already an idea about the challenge of model-based uh, control. The pioneer of model-based control was Xiang Xiu Zhen, the Chinese rocket pioneer. He popularized uh, cybernetics uh, shortly after uh, Wiener was doing that. And he was applying it for the feedback control uh, of uh, rockets uh, uh, on, the, on the rocket nozzle. What we do here is the following. We have a plant. So our configuration, car model, whatever. We have some sensor signals. We have an actuation command. The control law shall translate the sensor signals uh, to actuation commands and eventually to a good performance. And now we replace our plant by a good model. So the model gives you for the same actuation commands very similar sensor signals and also similar performances. If the model is good, you can derive controller and you can put the controller in the plant and then you get a similar performance benefit. So this is the, the, the old paradigm. You build your model, A is the flow state, B is the actuation commands, you sense something and you derive the control uh, as a function of what you can sense. So this is a path which may work beautifully for one frequency or perhaps also for two frequency, but if you have back turbulence, this approach is next to impossible. But if you look, for instance, at the eagle, <laughs> so what I'm doing now? No, 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 no. <laughs> So the eagle can land on a, on a stone under gusty wind conditions, remarkably elegantly. He uses his wings as the actuators, the orientation, can choose the orientation of the wing. Uh, it uh, has an accelerometer, the stomach, so it knows if it goes down, so it accelerates down or accelerates up. It can also... Uh, uh, feel the skin friction from the feathers under the wing. So there are a number of sensors and a number of actuators and he has to find the control logic which helps him to land on the stone. And he can do so very robustly because it can do so under many uh, gusty wind conditions. It can do so with a broken leg, with a filled stomach, under rain, whatever. And now uh, uh, think about would this be possible to do the same thing in the lab? <laughs> so the eagle obviously understands something about control, which we don't understand. And what he understands, he has to make smart move of trial, trial and error. So it's very easy to determine if a controller works. It's very difficult to derive it. And the eagle had uh, millions of years to uh, go through some trial and error. And this is a path which we are going to emulate in this talk. We need to uh, minimize some cost function, could be uh, coming quickly to the location on the rock, it could be reducing the uh, net uh, drag, on the, 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 reducing the drag of the car, and we want to penalize the actuation, we want to do it as swiftly as possible um, with some extra torque. And now, essentially, we are, talk we are solving a variational problem. In this variational problem, we have to find a controller which minimizes a cost function. No model involved. 
And I will show you uh, one uh, um, example how this can be done in something called machine learning control. Here we start with an ensemble of controllers uh, and we wish to find the global minimum. There are many other minimum. You see, if we start here and do gradient descent, we end up in, a, in the wrong lo local minima. So now we use a method, genetic algorithms, uh, uh, to, to find better controllers. This is generation one of uh, genetic algorithm. Who of you knows genetic algorithms? So also more than people have been in Shenzhen. That's good. And so this is the first generation, Monte Carlo spraying of these controllers. Next generation, we are going to the second best minimum, third generation, we, this is populated, fourth generation. It will uh, it covers the global minimum, and then in the next generation, this will be populated, but we are still searching for other controllers. And this is an example of genetic algorithms trying to find uh, a local minimum in a, in a complex terrain. But what we ac actually want to do, we want to uh, find a function, not just a parameter. We want to have a function from the sensor signal to the actuation commands. And this function can be found by a uh, uh, so big brother of genetic algorithm called genetic uh, programming. And what we are doing here, we are establishing two cycles. So one cycle from the sensors to the control with some trial controller. In the experiment, this may be one millisecond. So there's one millisecond delay from sensing to the actuation. And then we need something like maybe five or 10 seconds to figure out is the controller good or not good and we feed it back to genetic programming to find a new controller. And here is a, a methodology. I suggest if you have questions, we, you, we can come to it in the discussion part. So I'm not going to explain it here. It's just want to tell you that it is rather simple. And now we apply this genetic programming to the uh, Ahmed body and after less than one hour of testing, we find some controller with a drag reduction of 22% and an inferred actuation expense of 3%. Net energy efficiency, net energy reduction is something like 19%. And at the end, we find a controller where all the actuators are in unison and they are just listening to a single sensor S4, S4 is here. More precisely, they listen to the fluctuation at S4. And it turns out you need high frequency forcing for a good drag reduction effect. And this sensor is the only uh, possibility how you can um, make a feedback, a high frequency feedback from this actuation to sensing. So here you have a good signal to noise ratio. For the other sensors, you don't have it. So, so note what machine learning is doing here. It chooses the actuator, it chooses the sensors, and it also chooses the controllers. It's an amazingly uh, complex problem. Why is it physically successful? Well, we see it in the PIV behind the Ahmed body. This is the unforced wake. You see a reverse flow here and a downstream flow here. This is the forced wake. So superficially, it's roughly the same length. Looks pretty much the same. But we have a, a more streamlined way. We do something like bow tailing, and bow tailing is known to reduce the drag. So this is a mechanism behind this drag reduction. The next, so obviously we are successful in a short period of time. The next question is how uh, do we learn this controller? And now I put our five generations with 50 controllers and something called proximity map. In the proximity map, you find the controllers uh, which are close in the high dimensional space, in the Hilbert space, you find them close in the two dimensional space. So these, these controllers are similar and these controllers would be uh, different. The background here, uh, uh, 
shows the interpolated cost. Um, these black areas, they correspond to, um, to, to a maxima, so drag increase, and these grayer areas correspond to drag reduction. You see a couple of maxima, a couple of minima. The best value is found here in the corner. And this is a bit alarming. And the minima is found at the uh, corner. So it turns out when we analyze the control loss, then this gamma one here determines the frequencies. This is low frequency, this is high frequency, and this gamma two is correlated with a duty <coughs> cycle. This is a low duty cycle, this is a high duty cycle. And here we take the highest frequency and the lowest duty cycle, which can still be managed by the actuator. If we had a better actuator, we could, would go further down in this region. So now we see already being in the corner, we see, okay, we are reaching our hardware limitation. This is the advantage of this uh, proximity map. We did this for many dozens of experiments, many dozens of simulations. Uh, uh, a number of them have been published. I tried to summarize them in our 2019 uh, chapter for the fluid structure uh, uh, and interaction and, and, and control. MLC has always outperforms the existing optimized control, selects the sensors, actuators, and there are small chances if you do it with model-based control. Even worse, the mechanisms which we have, have found were typically based on frequencies or frequency crosstalks, which we did not expect, and which we also uh, typically did not find in textbooks uh, um, um, either. So machine learning really does a big service to, uh, to us. So now we go to a, a much more complex configuration. Uh, now it's in Shenzhen. When we want to control the uh, separation over a smooth surface, we need to be aware that the separation may happen at the beginning of the surface or may happen at the end. If we actuate too early, then the actuation effect will be evaporate before it is uh, effective. If we actuate too late uh, in the bluff body regions, we are not um, effective either. So we need to monitor the separation line and need to actuate in the neighborhood of this separation line. And this is the idea. Uh, behind having lots of sensors and lots of actuators in the area where separation may occur. And we don't do it on a car, we do it on a smooth ramp. Um, here you see the experiment with five rows and six actuators. These actuators can be fully retracted, so no effect. Uh, can the triangle so may move out and then it acts as a vortex generator. Now the height is one parameter and we can also blow in streamwise uh, direction. Uh, uh, now we have active control and we are listening to the pressure sensors in between. There are 42 pressure sensors. More precisely, we are listening to uh, eight, 42 short-term mean values and 42 fluctuation values. So we now we have 30 parameters to optimize, 30 controllers to determine with 84 sensor inputs. What we want to achieve, we want to reduce the pressure recovery, which is synonymous of uh, delaying um, the uh, separation. So quite a challenge, right? Uh, the first thing what we are doing, we are enriching our machine learning control based on genetic program, we add a suplex gradient search on it. We take the best individuals uh, and we do a linear interpolation and now we optimize the linear interpolation. And this way we can descend much quicker uh, to towards the minimum. So this gives us a speed up uh, of roughly a factor 10. So we need 10 uh, times, 10 times less uh, time to, 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 to learn the control of. Where is the challenge? Well, the challenge is here, uh, not only in the dimension. If you have a single input and a single output, then the controller roughly looks like this. You can play with it and you can tune it in the experiment and it works. If you have 10 actuators and 10 sensors, then you can take an um, algorithm from some, some book 
and you can renumber the inputs and renumber the outputs, you sh should get the same results. So here you may find your uh, regression solvers mapping a map vector of, to the vector. But if you have uh, distributed actuation and distributed sensing, what you are doing, you are mapping an image of sensing towards an image uh, um, of the actuation. And now the position of the controller is of utmost importance. You cannot afford to lose, to lose the position of the controller. And we will see in a moment how we are solving that. So first we sheet a bit, we put all the uh, actuators fully retracted, so we have the vortex generators, and we try to find 30 feedback controllers blowing in streamwise direction. Here you see the learning curve after about 1,000 uh, short tests. Uh, the pressure recovery is converged. We, we continued this thing further downstream. Most of the advantages, uh, performance increases come from our Zaplex method. And at the end, we have the main actuation in the front rows and hardly any actuation in the top rows. You see some asymmetry, which uh, comes uh, partially from the experiment and partially uh, from this type of, uh, of learning. If the velocity increases, then you need more and more of these uh, actuators. So this is not, not uh, starting. So machine learning control works for this simplified setup. Now we want to go one step uh, further. We also want to optimize the vortex generator's height. So 30 parameters plus 30 controllers listening to 84 controllers. So this gives uh, uh, rise to um, a real challenge. So how are we going to optimize the parameters for the vortex generators? So now we have to do uh, uh, physics informed manipulation of our sensor signals. What we say is the controller locally should just listen to the neighbors and listens to a global variable. So the neighbors uh, um, are the average pressure, are the average pressure gradient, are the pressure fluctuation, <coughs> are the fluctuation of the pressure uh, gradient. Four variables. So the actuation listens to these four quantities and we have the same four quantities characterizing the whole surface uh, here. Now we have four inputs, four, four inputs uh, local, four inputs global, uh, eight controller inputs. Note that the, the short-term average pressure signals here, they do hardly change in time and they can be used essentially as an input to drive slowly the height of the vortex generators. Now we have a controller listening to eight inputs uh, 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 one driving the height of the actuator, one driving the blowing. And we use again gradient enriched machine learning control. This is now a much easier task and it works. Here we see the cost function uh, and the actuation power. We don't penalize the actuation power. We see that. If we are investing more, then we get, can get somewhat better performance. We get already something for, without actuation, and this is what we get with uh, um, actuation on top. And when we are um, simplifying the problem somewhere, we get a worse performance. So this is here the natural performance. And, and this, is, this curve here comes from the classical machine learning control. We only use 500 evaluations. These are the controllers. The, this one drives the height of the vortex generators only listening to the uh, mean values. And this is the controllers driving the uh, uh, blowing, which can um, follow the flow in time. Good. Now let me give you some general perspectives. So I've talked already about model-based control and model-free control. Hopefully I've convinced you that this is a very powerful approach. In principle, you can use this machine learning also to determine a model. 
So here we have machine learning control, but in principle, uh, nobody can prevent you from putting a model on top of the plant and learning uh, to give you the same uh, sensor signals and the same cost function as the original plant. You can use the same box here uh, for modeling on the site. We did it in a couple of these publications. And you can also learn cost functions, which allow you to map the controller directly on the cost function with sufficient um, trustworthiness. This may help you to replace controllers. You can also find mappings from sensor signals to the cost function if it's not available in your final plant and so on. So you can use machine learning for many more um, purposes. And the goal is to have something like near optimal control models and estimators with the testing times of uh, up to 60 minutes. So we are, are already successful in terms of controls. Uh, we uh, still need to work on the models and the estimators. Next question you can ask, what is this magic uh, box machine learning? So I would say machine learning is a method trying uh, to uh, give you uh, uh, functions. You can either get a function if you have some data, if you have input and output data, then you try to find a function which is simple and close to the original data, or you may want to find uh, a function like in the controller, which optimizes a performance. So here data is kind of useless. Uh, if you do function fit fitting, there's one part which is trivial, interpolation. If this is the input, this is the output, then you would say, okay, the point in between uh, can be achieved by linear interpolation. If your data, if your data is uh, um, far away from the point of estimation, then extrapolation is next to impossible. So here in this point, you can say you do linear interpolation, you end up here, constant interpolation, you end up here, quadratic interpolation, you end up here. So you get completely different answers depending on your model. Same for the variational problem, for the control problem. You can do exploitation, gradient descent. This is easy. You can do exploration, finding new controllers. This is very hard. And there's something which machine learning does for you. It can simplify the data, uh, find a low dimensional representation of your high dimensional data, and it gives you a strategy how you can learn for the data, how you can avoid overfitting. So this is essentially uh, uh, um, a, a, a way of summarizing what machine learning uh, can do for you. And we, are ex we have been exploiting these parts in the past control examples. So AI, by the way, um, would also include some expert systems. Modeling is extremely difficult. So I would not go into this for our the applications, which I have shown. There's something which is very nice. You can do cluster-based models. That means you can take your original snapshot data, uh, cluster the data, so that means find few representative centroids which are close to the data and then you can look at the transitions between these um, uh, representative centroids they come with a probability to go from one centroid to the other and a typical transient time and then you can reproduce the original uh, um, system so this is a way which is rather easy and we have applied it to Lorentz system Russell system heart Kolmogorov flow, turbulent boundary layer, and we got a very good reproduction of the autocorrelation function of the dynamics and so on. You can find the details in our science advances paper. And now I can come to the conclusion. So I hope I've convinced you that uh, there is merit in using machine learning for your control applications. I would do it before you do any optimization. So machine learning creates a new paradigm makes our work much easier. If you have multiple input, multiple outputs, and machine learning control is a plug and play uh, a version. You can take our original software package, put it in the experiment, and most likely it will give you the optimal actuation uh, uh, mechanisms. Uh, and it has been vetted in dozens of experiments and simulations. You just need to invest a bit in your wind tunnel time. I've shown you the distributed input, distributed output. 
plant. In this case, you need to work a bit uh, uh, with a physics-informed preparation of the controllers. And the future developments will be merging machine learning control, reinforcement learning control, model predictive control. And a, lo a, lo a lot of the future will be done here in, in this university by uh, Andrea and uh, Stefano. So here we can still get probably 10 to 100 times gains in terms of the uh, uh, learning speed. There are a couple of things which you need to respect. If you go into the Arbena, I have um, try to make it simple. First, you have to find a good cost function. Uh, there's one question, how do you penalize actuation? I will not go in this, but you have to answer that. The next thing, you will never want to put the sensor signals in the controllers. You always want to have some features. The features could be, for instance, uh, the mean value and the pressure and the pressure fluctuations. That's what we did in all the examples we presented. Otherwise, the approach will not work. If you actuate at a frequency, you don't want to optimize the frequency, but you want to optimize the screw number. And now uh, this is valuable also for other oncoming velocity fields. Uh, if you have lots of actuators and sensors, you need to do some cost grainings, as I've presented. Uh, you need an exploration like genetic programming to identify new mechanisms. You need to have a good exploitation, something like gradient descent. You want to understand how your control learns. I've shown you the proximity map. I did not show you data topology, which is another very valuable tool. And you also want to visualize the controller. And this is also what your local experts can show you. Uh, there are some simple ways of interpreting the physics. That said, if you like uh, uh, this type of research, you may consider uh, uh, joining us at HIT Shenzhen. Uh, we have also very smart students. So our students are the top 10% from a national uh, uh, competition. And the working conditions, uh, working packages are Princeton uh, level. So we are working uh, mostly on uh, the low altitude economy. I'm going to show this at a later time. Uh, here in, in Madrid, and if you have questions, you can answer. You, you can you can ask me. So here is part of uh, uh, my team. So this is part of uh, one of our three labs. Here you see the world's largest fan array wind generator with 40 times 40 fans. The advantage is you can turn on and off uh, the fans in one or two seconds. Uh, and you can create arbitrary patterns. You see a couple of drones here building complexes. You can guess what kinds of games we are playing here. We also use it for commercial uh, uh, drone testing um, um, as well. And uh, you may want to read some of our books and some of our review articles. Machine learning control has been described by Guy in this book. This also comes with a software package. Uh, there are the a Cambridge book together with uh, Andrea and, 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 and Stefano. This uh, paper gets heavily cited, a uh, few citations every day now, so over 2,000 citations at this moment. And with that, I want to conclude, and I'm open for questions now.